you. Okay, thank you very much for the kind of introduction. As it's really my great honor to be here to participate in this workshop. Now today I'm going to talk about our listen well and the, some of the theoretical understanding of the uh, uh, some of the theoretical understanding as well as some applications from a perspective of like a supervised and unsupervised in learning, especially for the biomedical image reconstruction perspective. I believe some of the content is uh, I present this well in other workshops as well, so maybe some of the audience may heard about some of the thing, but I try to add more stuff here, so anyway, so. So as you know that deep neural network has a lot of advantage, uh, nowadays is a main tool for the imaging communities as well, and also a lot of, uh, a lot of other communities. So compared to the classical machine learning approach, deep neural network has a lot of advantages. For example, in the classical machine learning approaches, you need to actually have a uh, you need to actually have a dom uh, domain expert to actually extract some features to fit into the simple classifiers. But in the deep neural network, you need those kinds of domain expertise. Um, you can just directly fit in to the raw data in the deep neural network, and deep neural network automatically find the features and design classifier. Because of this simplicity, deep neural network has been widely used in many applications. Especially in the medical application, deep neural network has been successfully used for the diagnostic purposes, and also image segmentation purposes, and image registration purposes. In these kinds of approaches, usually, it starts with the image data, and then try to de uh, train the neural network for the purpose of diagnosis, or segmentation, and all those kinds of image analysis. In this talk, I mainly focus on the other aspect of the neural network. I believe many of the previous authors, uh, previous speakers mentioned about this, but we are actually, uh, nowadays we are now witnessing a lot of uh, nice uh, uh, implementation of the neural network directly from the sensor data to the image domain data so using the neural network. Okay, in fact, this field has been growing very rapidly for the last couple of years, and in fact, there are a lot of uh, papers currently available in a lot of different architectures and different kinds of applications. And in our recent DB papers and papers, we actually demonstrate that this kind of thing can be actually categorized into four different kinds of uh, architectures. For example, image domain learning and hybrid domain learning approaches and domain transform learning approaches and sensor domain learning approaches. For example, image domain learning approach is most widely used. We start with uh, degraded images. It's coming from the aliasing artifact or noises. And then your network tries to map the degraded images to the clean images. So here, you can actually easily use uh, off-the-shelf tools from the computer vision literatures to train the neural network. However, the downside of this one is, especially if we don't have enough data, it usually results in some blurry reconstructions. So people try to incorporate some data consistency as well and on top of this image domain learning approaches. So this is hybrid domain learning approaches. Another drastic different approach is a domain transform learning approach like AutoMap. It directly tries to map directly from the sensor data to the image domain. In that case, it usually need uh, to learn the global transform, so it requires some kind of fully connected layer. So it is computationally and also memory-wise is very expensive. Instead of doing that one, we just use analytic transform as a global transform, and then just uh, using the deep neural network as a sensor domain or measurement domain uh, CNN. In that case, for example, it can be used as interpolators or denoisers of the measurement data, and then neural network can be trained in the end-to-end -end manners as well. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, different approaches and architectures. And we, someone even can say that nowadays, in this problem, deep learning is n giving a new kind of face. And so it has been very widely accepted in many researchers and also industries as well. The reason for so success for the short time periods is because there are a lot of advantages. For example, compared to the compressed sensing, usually deep, neural, uh, deep learning based approaches provide a very high quality image reconstruction. Furthermore, the in terms of reconstruction time is very fast. For example, let's think about the compressed sensing MRI. In the conventional application, you need to acquire all the case-based data. It requires a huge amount of time, but computational uh, reconstruction-wise is very fast. Compressed sensing, you just acquire the sparse set of the data, but reconstruction time, you need to actually solve the optimization problem. It's, it's a huge amount of time. But machine learning approach can take the best of the both worlds. Where the measure coming from? It's coming from the training. So it actually train with, uh, training takes a long time, but this is not a downside of machine learning approaches because it's actually ideally suitable for the business model because vendors can train the neural network 
uh, using their lot of data, and then sell the model to the users, and user can buy it and then enjoy the real-time reconstruction. In fact, because of that, currently there is two, uh, three, uh, at least two commercially available deep learning software for the uh, city reconstruction already from uh, from GE and Canon is currently on the market already, and and furthermore. Uh, neural network was usually considered as a black box, but now man, many researches are going on, and then it's becoming more and more interpretable. This is actually the main talk of my talk, main part of my talk. In fact, actually, our group actually participated in three years ago uh, and pro proposed the first deep neural network architecture for the road of city construction, and the result was very excellent. But when I actually first showed this result to, to my clinical partners, the question I got from them is, yeah, the result is good, but why is it working? The next question I uh, end up with is, how can you guarantee it does not get, uh, have any kind of artificial features? Because medical imaging is a little different from the computer vision application. In the computer vision application, if you have a nice looking image, then that's good. But in the medical imaging cases, you need to guarantee it does not create any kind of cancers or lesions and etc. So you need to actually retain the original data as it is. So to answer this question, uh, we have, a, we have an, uh, investigating the law, uh, the where this kind of uh, power of um, uh, deep neural net are coming from, and this is actually some of the snapshot of the our result. In order to understand the the origin of the power of the neural net, we need to actually understand the mysterious force. For example, let's think about the uh, city problem. Rodo city problem usually there is a Rodo data and the clean image data, and then we use some kind of neural network, especially, for example, uh, unit architecture is now very popular and actually use most, uh, quite the most widely, one of the most widely architecture is in the inverse problem. Now, if you in this data in the unit architecture, then you have a very nice denoising result. Now, using the same network architecture, you just change uh, the training data with this kind of deconvolution problem, blurry images and clean images, you have a very nice reconstruction as well. Now, we actually fit in the data with the image in painting problem with an 80% missing, and you have uh, no missing data pairs. Then your network imaging works very well, too. So this is a very mysterious behavior, because actually, if you think about the classical, uh, classical signal processing approaches, if you actually have a different kinds of problem, you need to design a new kinds of algorithms for specific problem. Now here, same architecture works all kinds of problem by changing the training data. It looks very different from the classical approaches. So is it really very different kinds of black box compared to the compressed uh, uh, signal processing approaches? So in order to understand that question, you take actually go back to the classical approaches of the inverse problem. I would say the first step with the classical signal processing approaches start with the signal representation. Let's say X is a known image you want to reconstruct. Usually this is represented as a, as a linear expansion, especially like, a, for example, linear combination synthesis frame with the coefficient. And the coefficient itself is also calculated on, uh, with the inner product between analysis frame and uh, image itself. Okay? Now, this is a linear expansion, but uh, one, one of the nice, most important discovery people found in the signal processing community is now not all of this coefficient is non-zero. Many of this is a like only small set of coefficient is important, and the others are very negligible. For example, let's think about the wavelet transform. Then from this brain images, only a small set of the data is a non-zero, but we don't know the location. So in order to find the location, you need to actually fit in matching to the data fidelity term, and then imposing the sparsity. And by solving this kind of optimization problem, this, we are trying to find the location of the non-zero coefficient and uh, location of the basis representation. In fact, this is actually the main idea of basis pursued in compression in cases. So if you compare these kinds of classical approaches to the, to the machine learning approach, it looks very different. So the, in, in, in the, then that looks very different. But is there any kind of link between the two? In fact, our, one of the most important contribution I would say is actually we found that there is a very important link between these two seemingly different approaches. The thing is, let's think about this encoder-decoder network architecture. This is a noisy image, and this is clean image. And noisy image is X, and clean image is Y. The relationship between noisy image and clean image can be actually we demonstrate this can be represented as this kind of frame-like expansions, as you can see here. 
Furthermore, what it can show is that this encoder part of the neural network generate this analysis frame, and the decoder part of the neural network generate this synthesis frame. This is not a high level description. In fact, we have a close form expression of all these spaces. For example, let's start with uh, very simple cases with a linear neural network without any kinds of nonlinearities. What you can demonstrate is that the input output relationship is really linear expansion. And BI is now coming from the ice column of the B matrix. B matrix is represented as cascade multiplication of encoder matrix for each layer. Similarly, B theta i can be actually represented the ice column of the cascade multiplication of the encoder matrix. Furthermore, if you see the encoder and decoder matrix, you can see that this is actually coming from the pooling part of uh, pooling, uh, 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 matrix representation of pooling, convolved with the uh, filters, learn of filters. And also, the decoder part is also represented as unpooling layer, convoluted with this decoder part of the neural network. And from this expression, when the filter is learned, then there is no way to change the basic. So this is a linear representation. And, one of the important things you need to actually notice, we will revisit this one later, the structure of this. This pooling, the basis is now represented, the pooling convoluted with the filters. In fact, this is actually the origin of the convolution frame net, which is actually uh, uh, we'll talk about later. Okay, then what about linear neural network with this skip connection? As you know, the skip connection has been widely used in the neural network community. It turns out, if a street, there is a skip connection, then, uh, like to, uh, this expression doesn't change. The only difference is there is augmented blocks here in this matrix. So that means the number of basis frames are increasing more. So the, this become more redundant representation. In the signal processing community, we know that if redundant frame has a lot of advantages, noise robustness, and etc., we can see that similar kinds of behavior happen because of this, uh, this skip connections. And furthermore, based on that one, we can further demonstrate under some least strict condition, this is exactly the same as the frame condition, uh, frame net. For example, let's say two kinds of condition here. Uh, this is a, a frame condition for the uh, pulling layer and unpulling layer. And this is frame condition for the encoder and decoder filters. It's satisfied in this condition. We can demonstrate that this satisfies the perfect construction condition like a wavelet frame, okay? Furthermore, but however, in the neural network cases, this perfect reconstruction condition is not important because we need to do something. And oh, furthermore, it's very difficult to impose this condition in during the learning itself. However, it's easier to impose this condition about the pulling layer because this is not a learnable parameter. This is design parameter. We'll talk about the, uh, the advantage of using this frame condition in the pulling layer later. Now, however, as I mentioned, the neural network, most of the important power of the neural network is coming from the nonlinearity. So what happened in the, with the nonlinearity? It turns out that this expression doesn't change it, but the only difference is there is a diagonal matrix in between each encoder and decoder matrix. This diagonal matrix has a zero and one value. It's zero when ReLU is inactive and one when ReLU is active. Now, from here, now you see what happens here. Even though we have the same feature set, for the encoder and decoder, depending on the input, the number of uh, this pattern changes. Because at after multiplication, this bi and bt di column changes with respect to input value. So that means that's why this is a dependency of the x. And now we can see that this neural network is automatically adapted to with respect to the input, va uh, input value. Okay? Furthermore, what you can see is that ReLU is after the convolution operation, and the convolution is a linear operation. It actually determined the hyperplane. So what you can see is now, because of this ReLU operation, you can actually have a, this kind of uh, partitioning view of the feature space and the input space. For example, this is an example of the partitioning of the input space uh, with uh, three layer neurons with uh, two channels at each layer. For example, each neuron participates in spaces in two layer, and another neuron participates on another one. Then after that, this feature space is cascaded partition with the other neurons as layers goes on. And now what happens is very, what happens is now within this partition, it has the same linear representation, same frame-like representation, but across this partition, it has different representation. So that means, for example, if you are given with this knee data, then your network automatically find the linear representation of this by changing the ReLU activation pattern. If you actually have a brain data, your network automatically find this expression by changing the ReLU activation pattern. Okay? 
Now, you can see that what's the role of the neural network. In fact, this CNN and neural network is doing the automatic assignment to different linear representation with respect to the input value. So now we can see the close link between compared to this one with the basis pursuit algorithm in the classical signal processing. In classical signal processing, you try to find the linear basis representation by solving the optimization problem for each input. Now here in the neural network, it, during the training, it actually will partition the spaces. And then during the inference phase, it's just automatically assigned by changing the neural uh, level activation pattern. That actually gives a neural network uh, real-time reconstruction performances in the inference phase. From this perspective, you can easily expect that if the partitions are increasing, you, ha the, you have a more accurate uh, uh, piecewise linear approximation with a nonlinear mapping. So in fact, what happens is all those kinds of number of partitions is directly related to the neural network expressivity. And it turns out that number of partition is now changing the, depending on the neural network architecture. For example, by increasing the number of channels, we can show that number of partition increasing exponentially. And by increasing the number of network depths, we can also show that the partition number of partition increasing exponentially as well. And also by increasing the skip connection, you can also show that this representation uh, and partition increase ex exponentially as well. Furthermore, we can actually explicitly calculate the Lipsch constant for the neural network. The neural network is a very complicated nonlinear system, so it's a little bit difficult to actually calculate the ex exact values of a Lipsch constant. But now from this one, we can actually see that what happens here. Now it turns out that because of the piecewise linear continuous, and especially for the LELU case, what you can demonstrate is now this uh, Lipsch con uh, con constant is determined by the soup value of this linear uh, Lipsch constant for each linear reason. So, which means that even though this is complicated nonlinear system, by con but still we can by controlling the Lipsch constant for each linear reason, we can control the overall behavior. That actually means that neural network is has a, even though it's a nonlinear system, we can actually have a some way control based on the linear kinds of analysis as well. Now, from this perspective, you can see what happens in the neural network. For example, in the classical, uh, classical signal processing approach, like a compressing, we need to actually hire highly educated graduate student to do the design basis and do the optimization algorithm and et cetera. But now we don't need that one. Neural network automatically find the basis from the data itself and then do the reconstruction. That's actually the big difference compared to the classical machine learning approaches. Now, from this kind of theoretical understanding, we can actually do a lot of interesting um, things. For example, instead of designing from uh, uh, total bottom-up manners, we can actually design neural network in the top-down manners as well. For example, I give you some of the snapshots of the medical application. For example, let's think about ultrasound application first. And as you know, the ultrasound, there is a two kinds of uh, imaging mode available. One is a plane wave imaging mode, and the other focus, a focus beam mode. In the plane wave imaging, we actually eliminate the plane wave with a different angle. And focus beam mode, we actually eliminate the focus beam in the line by line. But in terms of reconstruction, it just records uh, return echoes. And then from the return echoes, we calculate the time of flight correction for the beam uh, focusing. And by adding focus beam together, and then by adding the angle of detection, you can actually have these kinds of images. But the problem of this one is this is just simple adder. And people try to improve this performance by doing some adaptive add, uh, beam uh, adding. So instead of doing just like a simple adders, we are now adding some optimization weight for this focus beam together. And for example, minimum balance beam for more cases, what happens is they calculate the weight in this way. As you can see, this is a covariance matrix for the data, which need to be calculated on the fly, and you need to invert it. This is a computation expensive. So because of that, all of this routine is a nonlinear function mappings. Now, given that this neural network is actually piecewise linear approximation of the nonlinear mapping, we can see that instead of calculating on the fly, we pre-calculated during the training and just automatically assign this optimization weight directly using the train, you know, neural network itself. So this is the main idea of the deep beam formula we propose. And furthermore, we can actually, one of the nice things, the advantage of deep neural network is it can be universal. So once neural network is trained, not only can be used for the full sample data, but if actually just sub, uh, you can actually train during the training, you actually train this data with this subsampled RF data or sub, uh, further subsampled RF data. But after training that, 
whatever condition it changes, neural network retains nearly the same qualities over the uh, many subsampling ranges. This, that's why it's called the universal deep informer. Now, this is some of the example. For example, we now apply this one for the plane wave imaging. Plane wave imaging, uh, after the time of flight correction, the raw data, uh, raw RF data consists of like a, a re receiver direction and plane wave direction, depth direction, three dimensional uh, cube. Now, we train our uh, deep informer such that we just use some of the depths of the data to directly map to the image domain IQ data as well. And this reference data is actually, in this case, a supervised learning. This is coming from the fully sampled and uh, optimal cases images from the DAS beamformer or minimum various beamformer or the convolution beamformers as well. Now, this is some of the example. Now, here in the top row, you can see is now, this is actually the planar wave imaging with the 31 plane wave and 64 receiver channel. Now, if actually reduce the plane wave by three, then you can see the degradation of the contrast is clearly. And, but now in the deep, uh, deep inf uh, neural, neural network, then if you do that, if you, even though you decrease it, you can retain the nearly the same kinds of performance. Now, if you reduce the number of receiver channels, you can have a degradation of the image quality, but still, deep neural network uh, tend to near the same quality. And quantitatively, it is about the same, but, during, uh, but convention mass of the degree is rapidly. You can do the same thing for the beam, uh, the uh, focus beam cases as well. For example, in that case, the only difference is the data cube. This is RX, and this is a scan line direction and depth direction. We train the same way. But here, we did more exotic thing. Instead of using the DAS data, we use a deconvolution data as a, as a target data. For example, this is the image domain deconvolution from here. And now you use this one as our labor data, and you are directly mapping the beamformer to have images. Now, this is actually the uh, phantom data, for example, standard method. And this is a deconvolution beamformer directly mapping from the raw data to here. Now, this is in vivo result has a more uh, uh, astonishing differences. For example, this is dust that, uh, that beamformer. But using the same data set, you can actually have a much more crispy images from the neural network directory. Now, another question from the theory we can answer is, which domain is good for the learning? For example, many of the people so I think that image domain learning is, uh, image domain is actually the essential domain to implement the neural network because neural network, especially CNN, is coming from the, inspired by the neuroscience perspective. For example, when some people see the faces and the visual cortex, the V1 layer, it actually sends the edge information. And as it goes more and more, it has a more hierarchical representation. So this is the main, uh, main justification. People say that, this CNN is useful and, uh, and is very powerful. However, given that CNN is actually nothing but the signal representation and the piecewise uh, frame kind of representation, we can, actually, uh, we can actually think about a little bit differently. So that means the better way to implement a neural network is a domain where this kind of frame type coefficient is uh, sparsely and concisely represented. So based on this, uh, this kind of understanding, we can actually design a neural network in the case-based domain, in the MR cases. Previous speaker mentioned about the case-based learning, but I will be a little bit more. For example, in, before the deep neural network, we, our group actually developed so-called unearthing feature-based Lorentz Hanke matrix approaches. The idea is as follows. For example, image can be sparsified with the high, uh, high pass filters. In the free domain, what happens is if you actually multiply with the high pass uh, spectral component, if you actually construct Hanke matrix from the case based data, you can show that this, this Hanke matrix has a low rank structure. Now, what happens is because of the low rank structures, if some of the case spaces are missing by doing the matrix completion, you can fill in this uh, case based data. This is the main idea of this. But it turns out that our theoretical work about, uh, uh, and we demonstrate that, and uh, for example, if Hanke matrix is actually a low rank structure, it's actually expansion, especially combustion frame length expansion can be actually presented in a concise way, which means that if actually instead of doing the neural net, uh, doing the, uh, doing the uh, low rank Hanke matrix completion, we can actually replace this one using a neural network because this expansion coefficient can be uh, concisely represented. So now we replace this one and then train in an end-to-end -end manner. This is some of the example. This is ground truth imagery. 
And this is a uh, radial trajectory accelerated at six times. And this is image domain learning approach and compressed sensing. And this is case space domain learning approaches. It looks good, but if you magnify, you can uh, see a little difference. This uh, light is not good. But there is a lot of noises in the background. And the compressed sensing is like a cartoon like artifact. And in the case space learning, usually it's very uh, well matches to the ground truth. And you can see the uh, cerebral veins here, but our later scholars, they didn't see anything in, in the structures. Furthermore, you can do design some other exotic domains to design your network as well. For example, this is a CT application. In the CT, before the dawn of the compressed sensing or item deconstruction, people try to find some kinds of like analytic construction algorithm for the combined trajectory or helical trajectory. One of the important discoveries they found is so-called the differentiated back projection idea. The idea is found, we have a sinogram data, and we are now differentiated along the angle direction and the back projecting. Then this one has a very important property. For example, we know the standard method of uh, C, uh, CT reconstruction is fatal back projection. We are doing the lamp filtering first and the back projecting. It's OK for the normal case, but however, if actually your data, uh, sinogram uh, data is uh, truncated, then this lamp filtering introduces some of the singularity along the truncated detector. So in that case, you have uh, some kind of singularities in the interior tomography problem. Back projection filtration idea is coming from the differentiated back projection. What they found is, if you do the differentiated back projection, the, what they found is there is only the part which remaining is actually this Hilbert transform. This is actually differentiated back projection domain, but if you compute the Hilbert transform along so-called the pile line here or code line, you can end up with this kind of image. That's the main idea of differentiated back projection algorithm. It has a lot of advantages. But one of the another uh, important advantage here is now after doing the differential back projection, this global transform coming from the radon transform disappears. Now this is actually coming from the deconvolution problem. Based on and also you can see that there is no singularities in this kinds of problem, even though the detector is truncated. Based on that one, you can see that it's easier to implement the uh, deconvolution algorithm using neural network rather than just like uh, learning with the singularity to another clean images. So based on that, you can actually design neural network in such a domain. So from this differential back pressure domain to the clean images using the CNN. Now this is some of the example. Here this is ground truth image. You can see that this is ROI size is different. This is total image and this is a very focused image. Now if we adjust to the filter back projection because of the singularity, we have uh, actually see the edges images like this. Now what happens here is now we are using the same neural network architecture, trained as an, uh, same neural network trained model. But by changing this ROI size, it works well for all the cases because our neural network is not sensitive to the singularity. But if you train the neural network from here to here in the image domain, it's sensitive to the uh, location of the singularity, so it's not generalized well. It only generalized for the specific ROI size, but not different sizes. We can also utilize this kinds of idea for other CT applications. For example, People use a combined trajectory using the circular trajectory and this detector. But, and people use a FDK algorithm. But in that case, this is ground truth image. But because of the large combined, you usually end up with the uh, decrease of the city numbers in the, peri uh, in the far end, as you can see here. Now, there's also a very nice theory about analytic constructions. They actually do some kind of exact factorization. That's actually doing the uh, differential back projection along this domain. And now, in this one, you can actually define some kinds of virtual power line. And now what they demonstrate is, now along this power line, there is a, uh, there is a uh, deconvolution relationship with this Hilbert transform with the unknown image. But the problem is here is that this is especially bearing, because this is along these images, and this is along these images. So that means you need to solve the specially bearing deconvolution problem. But neural network is doing well in those kinds of deconvolution problems. So we design a neural network directly in this domain. Now this is some of the example. This ground truth, and this is FTK images and total variation images. There is still remaining artifact. And if you just implement in the image domain neural network, it's better, but however, you can still see some of the artifact compared to here. But now if you actually implement a neural network, same, by the way, this is exactly the same unit architecture. But if you, you can, by just changing the transfer uh, domain of implementation, you have a much nicer construction compared to other things. Which means that 
you don't need to, yeah, in our group, we don't change the neural network architecture very much. We basically we use a UNET or some other frame version of the UNET in most of the application. But finding the domain which can be uh, sparsely or which can be consensually representing the signal is more important from our experiences. Furthermore, we can actually, as I mentioned, we can actually demonstrate how to improve the unit architecture from the theory. For example, as you know, UNET has a, a downsampling branch and a skip connection. And machine learning people say that this is a reduction of the high-frequency component can be compensated from this, uh, this skip connection. But however, if you analyze this pulling layer and unpulling layer from the frame theory perspective, it does not satisfy the frame condition. There is an additional term here. In fact, this is coming from the duplication of low-pass branch along this direction and another direction in this case. So how to address this problem? There's two ways. You can either subtract the low-pass branches and either add high-pass skip connection as well. It turns out this satisfies the dual-frame condition and this satisfies the type-frame condition. So we know that type-frame is better than dual-frame condition, so we can actually easily modify the unit architecture to satisfy this condition. So this is a standard unit architecture with the skip connection. Now we have additional skip connection for the high-pass branches as well. Now from here, we can see that uh, 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 this is a simple modification. Now, this is actually the independent verification of other group. In the, uh, the neighbor is a big, big company in Korea doing the AI researches. And this fourth author was my graduate student. Uh, former graduate student, he's now working with uh, Michael Unger. <laughs> but anyway, what he demonstrated, he applied this idea for the photorealistic star transfer. Uh, star transfer, they usually use this kind of encoder decoder structure. People use uh, just like encoder decoder structure, but it has a, it ends up with a lot of artifact. So they have the skip connection. But what he did is instead of doing that, on, we, they actually add a high a type frame unit with the high pass skip connections as well. Now this is uh, transferring from daytime images to the nighttime images. There's standard approaches. It's artistic, but it's not exactly photorealistic. But so what they do is after doing that, on, they do a lot of post processing, which is more computation expensive than the neural network itself. But by just simply changing the high pass branches, you can actually have a very nice reconstruction like this, photorealistic transfer. Same kind of thing happened from this image to changing this. You can clearly see the photorealistic star transfer compared to the conventional approaches. OK, now from this kind of theoretical understanding, we can actually see that uh, we can actually modify a lot of like, neural network architectures and also apply, think about different kinds of domain to neural networks as well. Now, so far I discussed about the supervised learning with the labeled data. But however, in medical imaging cases, there are a lot of cases we don't have a labeled data. I think the first speaker today mentioned about the unsupervised learning for the diagnostic purposes. And even in the reconstruction, same kind of problem exists. In fact, this is slide is actually coming from the Jan Lapun's famous KIG analogy. He actually showed that the reinforcement learning like AlphaGo is like a cherry in the cake, and the supervised learning is icing on the cake. But however, all the body of the cake itself is unsupervised learning. This is very important, and also most of the uh, machine learning problems are in, lies in the unsupervised learning cases. In fact, our groups started working on the unsupervised learning from these kinds of medical applications. Our clinical collaborators asked me to solve this problem. The problem is like this. They are uh, cardi cardiolo uh, radio uh, cardiac radiologists. What they do is they acquire multiple cardiac phase during the CT. So uh, the reason for that is because heart is moving. Sometimes some lesion is not visible in some, uh, some cardiac phase, but can be visible in different phase. But if they acquire this one for the high dose order cases, then in that case, there is too much radiation though. So they just acquire one high dose in one diocese phase, and the other is in the low dose case. Now, the question is, using these high dose data, how can I actually improve these low data using the machine learning approach? In fact, this cannot be solved using the supervised learning because heart is moving, so this is not a perfect match. So how can you solve this problem? At the time, actually, our students, we actually end up with some kind of uh, 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 star transfer idea from the neural network architectures and using especially for the cyclic architectures and apply this one using the cyclic architecture from the low dose image to the high dose image in the hope that it will work. And in fact, it works very well. 
So what happens is, this is a 5% uh, dose with a lot of architectures here, uh, artifact here. And this is a full dose data in different phases. We see that the structure is different. Now, using this kind of star transfer ideas, now you can see that the reconstruction result is very clear. And it, uh, if we subtract this image to this image, there is no structure variation. Only the noise is removed. Furthermore, if we just use different kinds of architecture, like a GAN architecture, then it looks good. However, if you see the detail, there is a variation. It's so much natural, but that is a problem. As you can see, there is a lesions here, which was not appearance in this case. If we subtract this image versus this image, then a lot of structures are really appears. This is a problem. But if you use this kind of psychic architecture with this identity rows, we end up with a very nice result with only noise are removed. And for example, in some cases, you can actually put the high dose data in, as an input of the neural network. What you expect is it doesn't process anything. It turns out our network doesn't do anything. But the other GAN and those things change the structure very rapidly. Okay? So that means this work, can, we can actually control this kind of thing. This actually start to, uh, start to uh, this actually inspire us. Maybe there is something inside of the psychic and architectures. So this is actually the talk. The, uh, this is the part I want to talk about a little bit for the last uh, remaining of part of my talk. So here, in order to understand the psychic and architectures and then this is the role of the unsupervised learning, you, take, uh, you need to start to understand from the optimal transport. I believe one of the speakers in the first day talked about the optimal transport, yes. Uh, and, and anyway, so, I, uh, so optimal transport is basically transporting the two, between two major spaces with, uh, by minimizing the transportation cost. This is a very classical problem in the, uh, in the probability theories and major theory analysis. Here, one of the famous formulation is the counterfeit formulation. In that case, is it tried to minimize the transportation cost uh, over average transportation cost by finding the joint measure to minimize this overall uh, transportation cost. This is optimization problem. Now, as a transportation cost, if you just put this norm between two samples in the two major spaces, then this is actually the simplest thing you can think about. In that case, is very interesting. It ends up with the very famous Weierstrass gun architecture. This is the main idea where the W gun architecture is so popular in machine learning communities. Here, what happens is now we have a two minimax. We have a minimax problem. This is actually in the machine learning community, this is called a uh, uh, discriminator, and this is a generator. We are now competing the generator to minimize these differences, and uh, we are now uh, trained the uh, discriminator to maximizing the differences. In terms of optimal transportation uh, perspective, this is so-called counterintuitive potential. And anyway, so from this kind of minimization problem, from this kind of Gaussian noise, in people demonstrate a lot of very realistic images out of this kind of thing. OK? Now, now, our theoretical understanding is started from this formulation. Now, as I mentioned, if this is uh, using the simple kinds of cost function, we end up with this kind of GAN uh, uh, I'm sorry, the GAN architecture. Now, instead of using this, in fact, actually, this cost function is quite often used in, in this uh, inverse problem community as well. We actually design a new kind of penalized cost function like this. So here, this is, a, this is a data fidelity term, and this is a regression term. Now, this regression term is a little bit different compared to the standard penalized least square. Standard penalized least square, the regression term is actually assuming some kind of prior distribution. But now we are assuming this existence of the inverse mapping from this y to here. And by doing that, then you can actually reduce uncertainties of the input uh, variables to actually impose some kinds of effect. So that means if, this is, if, find, if we find the global minimum such that this cost function is zero, you are now finding the exact inverse. Now, under this condition, what you can demonstrate is if we plug in this one inside the optimal transport uh, problem and find the dual problem, it turns out it actually ends up with the psychic and architecture. So we have a psychic and with uh, a psycho consistent term and gantom. So psychic consistent term is now a very interesting structure here. 
this is uh, now the generator, and this is actually coming from the physics model, and this is physics model and generator, and this GAN is actually the same architecture here. Now from here, now you can design this kind of unsupervised learning in a top-down manner as well. For example, let's think about some example. Now let's think about the uh, deconvolution problem. The convolution problem is actually data fidelity term is why measurement is blurry image is actually convolved with uh, some kind of corner uh, point spread function with the unknown x. Blind deconvolution problem, this is unknown as well. So we are interested in this blind deconvolution problem. Now as I mentioned, we actually impose these kinds of penalty functions as well. Now from this one, if you solve the dual problem, you end up with this kind of psychic architecture. Now, we have a very different kinds of formulation, uh, uh, very important differences. Now, standard psychic art, we have uh, this generator and additional generator using the neural network. Now, based on this formulation, you end up with a simple linear layer here, which actually estimates the point spread function. Now, you solve this one using the discriminators and using, because of that, this is a simple, so the optimization then is, uh, is much more easier to handle and less sensitive. Now this is some of the example. This is a real data, which is actually acquired from the fluorescent microscopy data. And this is commercially available software. And this is a reconstruction using this one as a reference data to train in a supervised manner. And you reconstruct this one. And this is conventional cyclic architecture with the two deep neural network generators. And this is our architecture with the one neural network with the uh, PSF kernel unknown piece of corner. Now, this is a microtubule structure, so it should be connected to each other, but you can actually retain this kind of connectivity using this kind of result as well. Now, you can actually use this one for the unspoiled by learning for the compressed sensing MRI. Usually in the compressed sensing MRI, uh, the machine learning approach, we start with the fully, uh, fully sampled data used as a reference to train the neural network. But now, we don't have any matched high resolution images and uh, uh, low uh, the uh, uh, subsample data. In that case, what you can demonstrate is you can still implement this kind of supervised learning. For example, this is coming from the data fidelity huh? physics. We have free transform and subsampling and inverse free, free transform. The reason we're imposing this one again is we want to implement everything in the image domain in this example. So because of that, the image is blurry with the aliasing artifact. Now, however, this is data fidelity term, and this is, again, penalty terms we actually have it. Now, one of the nice things about this one is that your problem with this one end up with these kind of architectures here. One of the differences here is this is the deep neural network, but now this is determinist term. We don't need to train. Furthermore, there is a two discriminator, but discriminator is usually competing with a generator, but there is nothing to train here. So those discriminator is redundant. So there is only one uh, discriminator in these cases. So this is much more easy to train. So this is some of the example. This is the input images here. And this is supervised learning approaches. And this is a conventional cyclic approaches. Uh, it's better, but still remaining a artifact here. But now, using this kind of new architectures, you can clearly see that nearly the comparable image quality compared to the supervised learning approaches, as you can see here. In summary, so as I mentioned nowadays, and deep learning has been very important uh, platform for medical imaging application in, in terms of image analysis, diagnosis, and the image reconstruction. And so far, to understand why this deep neural network works for the image reconstruction purpose, we demonstrate this deep neural network with the LELU is, in fact, a piecewise frame like representation to try to map, uh, do the uh, piecewise linear approximation of nonlinear mapping. And also, uh, this kind of unsupervised learning. Yeah, this is not the total solution, but this is one way to solve this unsupervised learning is using by combining these ideas uh, with the psychic architectures. With that, Thank you much for, uh, for your attention, and I'd like to thank my funding agencies. Yeah.